sometimes just when people hear somebody else say that, like the first time they'll say out loud, like, gosh, I was abused as a kid. And when they hear an adult say, and it wasn't your fault, like sometimes tears will just stream down people's faces because they've held on to that for so long to be able to hear, it wasn't your fault and you didn't deserve that. It's really powerful. Because we seem to have this idea that the longer you think about a problem, the more time you spend on it, the better off you're going to be. But there's actually no research behind that that proves that that's true. So it takes like your body uh, 90 seconds. Uh, your body has a 90 second physiological response when something happens. And after that, this is my understanding, so I'd love to hear from you. We're kind of living in a story of the past they're sitting around and they're feeling sorry for themselves or they're blaming other people for their problems. Like it didn't matter how much gratitude you have or how many times you're doing these other things if you're doing these bad habits. Okay, Amy Morin, welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I am so stoked to connect with you. Like I said before we hit record, I actually recently came across your work. And for someone who speaks on mental health, specifically mental health in the workplace, speaking at corporate and things like that, I feel so remiss not having uh, known about you previously. So for our guests, you know, rather than me give you an intro, I'd love to hear from you kind of how you fell into the mental health world through your story, your personal transformation and the work that you're doing in the world. Sure thing. So I, I'm a therapist by trade. It was something that uh, I had just decided in college, hey, this looks like a cool idea. Decided to pursue it and um, thought, gee, I have all this wisdom from the things I learned in my textbooks and I'm going to now be a therapist who teaches people all these wonderful things I learned in college, but it was actually through my own journey with mental health that I learned so much more and learned, I guess, applied the lessons from college on a much deeper level. So the first year out of college, my mom passed away suddenly uh, from a brain aneurysm. And she and I had been really close. And it was that grief that I was going through and seeing my dad by himself now and figuring out now, how do I get through life you know, without my mom? really taught me a lot. And as a therapist who was seeing clients and so many of them were going through their own emotional struggles, I would see so many people who would grow from their pain and so many people who would get stuck. And I just thought, how do I become somebody who learns and grows? And I didn't want to become bitter and resentful in life. And on the, it was three years to the day that my mom died, my 26 year old husband died. Obviously at 26, you uh, don't expect to become a widow. And I don't even have words for it, even though I'm a therapist and I'm an author. It's like, I don't really have words to explain what that period in my life was like. But uh, I woke up and I no longer had my husband and my mom, the two most important people in my life. And similarly, like I had lost my mom suddenly and unexpectedly. I lost my husband from a heart attack. He was fine one minute and gone the next. And it really took a number on my brain to figure out, like, how could this be possible that uh, the two people I love the most are, are now gone and they're not coming back? And I knew that we all had this message, you know, like, oh, time heals everything. It doesn't. And I didn't want to just sit around and wait to feel better. But it's so tempting to, like, go around the pain, but you have to go through it if you want to heal. And, oh, it was excruciating to go through for for years. and. One of the things I had learned from the people in my therapy office was, you know, it's not always what people do. Sometimes the most important thing is what they don't do. People who don't have a specific set of bad habits tend to do better in life. And so I really clung to that because the last thing I wanted was a long to-do list. But I thought as long as I focus on what not to do, maybe I'll be okay. And um, it was a few years later, I'm working on building a sort of new life for myself, figuring out who am I now and what do I want my life to look like? And was fortunate enough to, to find love again. And I got a new job, a new house. Life's looking pretty good. And then, boom, my father-in-law is diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I remember having those thoughts of like, you know, almost like life dared me to be happy for a minute. And then here we go again. And I just thought, this isn't fair. I don't want to grieve. I've spent so much time grieving obviously that's not wasn't an option at that moment but I sat down and I wrote what was the letter to myself about what mentally strong people don't do and when I was done I had a list of 13 things decided a few days later because I found that list helpful so I put it on the internet hoped somebody else would find it helpful but 50 million people read the list 
And I got a book deal out of it. And it's really because of that that I now get to go around speaking about mental strength and what I learned, not just from my work as a therapist, but through my own journey about how to give up unhealthy habits that threaten to hold us back. That's incredible. And thank you for sharing your story. I mean, you know, my condolences. How many years has it been now since um, it so started it's with your mother? started in 2003. It was like this. And, you know, I don't in my book, I actually start leaving some stuff out because I felt like it was this like awful country song. So my mom passed away 2003. I lost my husband in 2006. It was maybe four years after that. I lost my father-in-law. Then I lost a, a foster child. A former foster child had passed away. Um, and so it was a solid decade of of grieving, but uh, I guess 2014 was when life started to to turn around for me and things have been better since. And what would you say was the catalyst to things that start to help things turn around? Would it be the the flip of the mindset of what the people don't do versus adding more to your plate? Or what specifically could you help? Because so many people, especially in the past few years with the pandemic and the lockdowns. And, you know, for those of us that have chosen to go within and really see what's there, now right. everything's coming to the surface. And some people just, you know, we can't, uh, no, you can't run from it. So what comes up for you in terms of helping people right now that feel like everything's dumping and their world is just collapsing? Yeah, I knew when I felt like that again, just knowing just don't do certain things. And I would see it in my therapy office. People would come in and they were like, okay, Amy, I've I practiced gratitude for uh, six days this week and I've been working on uh, exercising and I'm trying to take care of my health and I'm reading 75 pages in a book a week and they had all these things that they were trying to do. But then they're like the rest of the week, they're sitting around and they're feeling sorry for themselves or they're blaming other people for their problems. Like it didn't matter how much gratitude you have or how many times you're doing these other things if you're doing these bad habits. So for me, that was it. Like, okay, just come up with this list read it over, remind yourself, don't do these things. And life just felt like it was manageable at that point for me. And I tried to look at it too. Like I thought, you know, as a, I'm a clinical social worker and we're trained to build on people's strengths. When they come in your office, you point out what they're doing well and tell them to keep doing that. And there's value in that. But I couldn't just shake the idea that if, if I were going to go see a physical trainer and they tell me to run on the treadmill, like, great. But I really also want them to tell me to like quit eating the jelly donuts on my way to the gym because that's way easier to give up another couple jelly donuts than it is to run for four more hours on the treadmill. And I thought, you know, somebody would be, really be doing a disservice. I'd be angry if I went to see somebody and they didn't say, hey, you have these two bad habits that are really counterproductive. So I wanted to help people figure that out. Like, what's the one or two things that I'm doing maybe that's just keeping me back, holding me from reaching my greatest potential because I guarantee people already have so many good habits, so many things they're trying. And what if we just worked smarter instead of harder? Yeah, that resonates deeply with me because when I first started to go on the path of within spiritual journey, what I call soul development, you know, I try to stack all the things I know it's a lot of us do. You wake up in the morning, you're like, all right, I got to get my 20 minutes of meditation and let right. me journal about my experience. Oh, you can't forget about breath work, time ago, yoga, up, oh, gotta go and walk and be at one with nature, right? And you start approaching it as a to-do list. Whereas when we talk about spirituality, it's really much less of doing and way more of being. So right. I'd love to hear from your, you know, being a psychotherapist and having PhD, right? To your name? I master's degree. Master's degree, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But your schooling, because mine is like so much intuition, having these conversations with people and lived experience. But could you speak a little bit more from your education at what comes up about doing less as well? Yeah, you know, I guess in terms of my education, a lot of that was focused on exactly that, like a sort of prescribed thing, tell people to do 20 minutes of exercise and tell them to get eight hours of sleep and take care of their bodies, take care of their minds. And there's tons of research behind all of those things, spending time in nature, going for a walk on your lunch break, as opposed to staring at your screen. Tons of research behind all of that. However, uh, if we live life in a super prescribed way like that, um, it sort of zaps all the fun and joy and uh, ability to, to make our own healthy decisions. And again, like, Sometimes we have these ideas of like, you know, venting is really good for you because if you hold in all your feelings then you're going to explode, well, that's actually not the case. Like if you think about that, somebody who goes to an office job from nine to five, you get home at the end of the day and you vent to your partner for four hours, 
it's not like you then have like released this pressure that was building up inside of you. Instead, you've spent hours now just venting and complaining about something and it actually adds fuel to the fire. So I wanted to make sure people would know, yeah, okay, that's great that you have all these good, healthy habits all day long that we learned in our textbooks are good for you. But again, let's look at the bad habits like that, that can just really undo a lot of the good habits that you have. Absolutely. And something that's just coming up uh, right now for me is the 90 second rule. You familiar with that one? Yes. Yeah. So it takes like your body at 90 seconds, uh, your body has a 90 second physiological response when something happens. And after that, this is my understanding. So I'd love to hear from you. We're kind of living in a story of the past. And you, we can see this with children so much, right? Because oftentimes when they're younger children, they have that temper tantrum. And then after a couple of minutes, they're fine. And I'm witnessing this right now with our six-year-old because you know, now she's getting to the point where like she's staying in that story, where it was just like six months ago <laughs> that that would pass. But now she's staying in that story. Could you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah. And, you know, we all do that even when we're not six anymore, that sometimes we just get stuck in that cycle where we have this physiological response or emotions. And then then it becomes about the story that we tell ourselves about that. So if you have an interaction with somebody at the grocery store and maybe the clerk is rude, and your perception. And so then you walk out to the car and you're still thinking about that person who was rude to you and they shouldn't have behaved like that. And suddenly it might bring you right back to when you were 12 and somebody was mean to you on the bus. And the story that you tell yourself about that interaction, like all people are bad and they're always out to get me. And it comes up in our belief systems about ourselves and the world. In reality, maybe the clerk was having a bad day or maybe you misinterpreted something that they said. There's a lot of stories that you could come up with. But sometimes we come up with that story that repeats itself over and over in terms of how we see ourselves, other people and the world in general. And it keeps us stuck in that cycle so that we just are living in the past because we're ruminating, rehashing and instead of just enjoying whatever is right in front of us right now. So how do we overcome that then? So, you know, I'm a fan of several things because we all do it. And when we tell ourselves, well, just don't think about that thing that upset us. Like the more we say, don't think about it, the more we actually think about it. And so in my therapy office, I'll often do an exercise with people where I'll say, OK, for 30 seconds, I want you to think about white bears, nothing but white bears. Ready, set, go. And then we spend 30 seconds and they're imagining polar bears, stuffed bears, whatever. And then at the end of that 30 seconds, I'll say, I'm going to give you 30 more seconds. Think about absolutely anything you want. But whatever you do, don't think about white bears, to which they then usually start to laugh because you're not going to make it 30 seconds without a little white bear popping up into your brain. We're just terrible at that. But then I'll say, OK, when the 30 seconds is over, I'll give them an exercise like, OK, you have 30 more seconds. So just uh, draw a self -port portrait with your non-dominant hand, something like that. At the end of that, I'll say, well, how much did you think about white bears when you were drawing a picture of yourself? They're like, oh, I didn't. I was so concentrating on that. I actually forgot about the white bears. That's a perfect example of how we can change the channel in our brain in real life. And so if you have something that happens at lunchtime that didn't go well, and now it's six o'clock in the evening and you're still replaying it in your brain, don't just tell yourself, well, don't think about that because I guarantee you will. But get up and go do something. Do something that gets your mind off of it for a few minutes. And it's not to permanently distract yourself, but a temporary distraction can at least reduce the phys physiological responses you might have. It can reduce your emotions. So you might be able to see it a little bit differently. And to know, like when you're sitting down and thinking about something, you can also ask yourself, am I dwelling on the problem or am I reaching for a solution? Big difference. If you're just rehashing something over and over, you're not really problem solving. But if you say, OK, well, I'm actually looking for an active solution and I'm going to try something, you might even set a time limit. Like at the end of 10 minutes, I'm going to come up with a solution and I'm just going to pick pick it and maybe you brainstorm for 10 minutes because we seem to have this idea that the longer you think about a problem, the more time you spend on it, the better off you're going to be. But there's actually no research behind that that proves that that's true. There's a lot of uh, evidence that just give yourself a break from problem solving for a little bit. And actually the back of your brain like figures it out. So I think it's all about sometimes just being more conscious of where we're giving our mental energy to. If it's just a problem, rehashing, ruminating, something that we can't solve then maybe it's about saying, well, here's how I am going to solve how I feel about the problem. Not all problems can be fixed. If you have a loved one that has a health problem, you might not be able to fix it, but you can at least say, I'm going to manage how I feel about it. Here's how I'm going to take care of myself. So true. And I bet that's something that you 
had uh, a lot of experience in 20 years ago. I mean, when, when you losing your husband at 26, losing your mother, you said you lost a, a foster child as well. I did. So a former foster child, I was a foster parent. Uh, my first husband and I were foster parent for years. And um, uh, a few years before he passed away, it was like my goal when I graduated college. It was one of the first things I wanted to do was to become a foster parent. I had learned at a young age that there were plenty of kids who uh, didn't have parents. And I always thought that's the saddest thing. And a lot of kids age out of the system. And as a social worker, I would see that too, that kids would um, turn 18. And if they never got adopted, it's like at the age of 18, they then didn't have any place to go. And I thought, it's just so heartbreaking. And so uh, I had decided to become a foster parent. And then after my husband passed away, I had to wrestle with a decision. Do I still want to be a foster mom as a single person or not? And I took a lot of time off from it, but eventually went back to it. But um, and then when I was remarried, my second husband was uh, on board with it, too. So um, the one of the last foster kids that we had was a, a teenager. And um, we ended up with a lot of teenage girls who um, they get kind of a bad rap in the foster care system because um, people tend to want the younger kids. But um, after living with us, she had moved, um, moved on, moved back with her biological family and later on uh, died of a drug overdose. Wow. And just the thought of, you know, this kid that had lived with us for a long time and then struggled so much with an addiction later on in life that um, had a very sad ending to her life. It was one of those things where I can just imagine thinking, you know, like, gosh, if we'd only taught her something slightly different, if there were skills we could have taught her. And I know inherently, like, it's not our fault if somebody has an addiction, it's not your fault. But, you know, on an emotional level, you still have those questions of like, what could I have done differently to have prevented it? So how did you handle that situation with those thoughts arising? Yeah, you know, it, again, one of those were like, well, what would you say to somebody else, Amy? And I know if my friend said, hey, I'm wrestling with this issue, what do you think? Or if somebody were in my therapy office, obviously I would tell them like, you know, gee, it's not your fault. And that's incredibly sad. And, uh, you know, it's a, one of those stories of, yes, anybody in the world can develop an addiction no matter what. And um, there are a lot of biological processes and environmental and mental health issues and things that all come into play when it comes to that. And just, I guess, forgiving myself and knowing I did the best I could with what I had. But, um, yeah, it took took some work to work through that forgiveness is coming up a lot for me today and it's been coming up a lot recently and i read in a book that i mentioned to you which uh, before we hit record they reference your work in the book it's called uh, 10 secrets of awakening and in this book he mentioned the stoppage of karma is forgiveness mm. It's very interesting. And so I had a Kashik Records reading for, are you familiar with the Kashik Records? No. Mm -mm. So I'm very much esoteric. I'm into the woo. I'm very much spirituality. In the Kashik field, they say it's the field where all the history, like it's the library of the soul. So whatever happened ever on this planet, other dimensions, on all plants, space and time, parallel lives, future, past, everything is stored in this dimension. And you work with a channeler to en enter the field and they channel from the light beings that reside in the Akashic field. And something very powerful came up today as a theme of forgiveness with my private group when we brought in our Akashic Records reader, uh, Candice Rasa. She's incredible. Thank you, Candice. Shout out to you. But forgiveness has been coming up so much. And I really think about it in terms of my life. Like, am I forgiving myself? You know, because I think that's one of the things I'd love to hear your take on this because we carry such burdens as humans and especially those of us that are into personal development and growth and transformation and doing our best to improve our own, own mental well-being. And oftentimes, like we forget about ourselves, we forget about self-care, we forget about self-love, you know, what comes up for you around this topic? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting, I think, because we do talk about forgiving somebody else. And sometimes people are quick to be like, oh, I forgive you. But we are often a lot slower, myself included, to say, you know, OK, I'm a human being. I made a mistake and that's OK. Or um, or recognizing, too, when we blame ourselves for things that aren't our fault. Can't tell you how many people 
I've met over the years who blamed themselves for like something horrible that happened to them when they were kids. And like, it wasn't, it wasn't your fault. And sometimes just when people hear somebody else say that, like the first time they'll say out loud, like, gosh, I was abused as a kid. And when they hear an adult say, and it wasn't your fault, like sometimes tears will just stream down people's faces because they've held on to that for so long to be able to hear wasn't your fault and you didn't deserve that. It's really powerful, but difficult sometimes to remind ourselves like, okay, if I messed up, then I messed up and that's okay. And I can forgive myself and move forward. But then to also ask, am I unnecessarily blaming myself for something that wasn't my fault? And how much responsibility do I bear? Even if it's a relationship that ended, and maybe you weren't the perfect partner, but how much of it was your fault? And just trying to figure out what what's my slice of responsibility in this? And sometimes with clients, we will draw out the pie chart and really say, you know, like, what's the piece of your pie here? And to look at how much people often blame themselves for things that are outside of their control and to figure out, you know, how much of that was within my control? How much do I, responsibility do I bear for this? And sometimes we have to do a lot of work to work through that. Yeah. How do we finally let go? You know, I think it's a, daily decision sometimes to say okay and to recognize how it affects us in the long term like for somebody who says you know i really messed up and i'm gonna hold on to that well then how does that affect your daily daily life now and i've worked with some people who have done some pretty bad things over the years people that have committed crimes hurt other people but you know if they came to the conclusion of i'm a bad person they probably weren't going to make any better decisions moving forward. And so sometimes it's about that shame and shifting it to say, I made a bad choice, but I'm still a good person. And we know from the research that somebody who says, OK, I'm a good person who made a bad choice. You'll go on to make much better choices than the person who says, you know, I'm a bad guy. I've always messed up and that's just who I am. Like, I guarantee that you'll stay stuck in a cycle of shame and you're kind of then dooming yourself to repeat those same same things over and over again. Yeah, that brings up neuroscience for me and like, uh, you know, Joe Dispenza, whoever, um, other people, it's not just him. I mean, I first heard it from him, though, it's how we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day, 80% of those are from the day before. And the real kicker is that 90% of those thoughts are negative. So the question right. becomes, how do we actually rewire the neural pathways? How, how do we move forward? And I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. One of the things, you know, I think is to recognize like the thoughts that are helpful and unhelpful, because sometimes even when we talk about positive versus negative thoughts, like sometimes things are bad and a, and a thought about how bad something is could still be realistic. And if you're realistically thinking it's not that even if it's negative, like that's not necessarily a bad thing, but to recognize that sometimes thoughts are unhelpful, like beating yourself up over and over again, not helpful. Replaying things that already happened in your head over and over again, not helpful. Um, so I often work with people on that. Like, let's look at what's helpful, what's not helpful. The tapes that keep replaying in your brain over and over again, or the ones that just reinforce the unhealthy beliefs. Somebody who says I'm not good enough is going to look for evidence all day long that they're not good enough. And if you look for it, you'll find it. And then any evidence to the contrary, like, wow, I did well over here. I'm doing great in this area of my life. We dismiss it or we think, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. So I love to just be sometimes write things down. For people who say, you know, I'm not really a journaler, like that's OK. You don't necessarily have to keep a, a in-depth journal of your life, but sometimes just putting something on paper and the pros and the cons, the beliefs, things that are contrary to the beliefs that you hold. So if you think um, I'm not a very smart person, write down all the evidence that maybe you are a smart person. And then uh, read that list over to yourself. Uh, sometimes we can just take a step back and say, you know, what's what's going on in my brain? And then sometimes you got to go after the good. So it could be saying, you know, if I'm going to write down five good things I did today at work, or I'm going to write down three positive things about my relationship. And you can train your brain over time to say, okay, I'm going to look for the good things in life. And if you're somebody who worries and rehashes, another favorite exercise of mine is scheduling time to worry, which sounds ridiculous, but um, you set aside 20 minutes every day to worry, you put it on your calendar. Like I'm going to worry from seven to seven twenty every night. And when you catch yourself worrying outside of that time, you just say, Hey, I'm going to worry about that later. And then when your worrying time comes around, you sit down and you worry a little hard out for 20 minutes and then you get up and you go do something else. 
And we know that with practice, like you can literally train your brain to contain all that worrying to just 20 minutes a day. And for people who say, I used to worry 24 seven, like that's a huge difference. Like I can now be more in the moment of my life because I'm not rehashing all those things and I'm not focused on all the catastrophic what ifs anymore. I'm able to enjoy the here and now. This is hysterical to me. I love it. So you set a, a 20 minutes on your calendar to worry. So pr I'm a practical guy, right? And I mm -hmm. am also someone who is very much into structured flow. I have structure. I use my calendar, also my flow. For myself and for anyone listening that is intrigued by 20 minutes uh, setting aside to worry, walk us through how this actually works. Like something comes up, and you're worrying, first of all, you have to have that awareness. Like that's the first step. If you right. don't have that awareness, then you're, you're never going to get there. And I'm thinking of someone in my life, I won't name any names that could really use this, this, uh, exercise, but this person doesn't have the awareness to catch it. So could you walk us from a very like fundamental level of how you would, uh, structure 20 minutes of worry time in your day? Yeah. So if, and you're right, the awareness piece is huge because sometimes people have so many worrisome thoughts all day that they don't recognize when they're worrying. So I'll often ask people to maybe set a timer on their phone and it just go, it makes a ding every hour. And in that hour, just check in and say, Hey, what was I just thinking about? And then is that something that's within my control or not? Because sometimes maybe you're worried about like, hey, what am I going to have for dinner? You're not really worrying about it, but you're trying to problem solve. Like, do I have the ingredients? Am I going to uh, order in? Am I going to go out to dinner? What's my plan? And that's helpful in the moment because you probably need to eat. But if you're then thinking about, my goodness, uh, I have a friend coming over on Saturday. We don't know. I'm, I'm probably have to cook dinner for them. I don't have anything to make. They're not going to like what I serve. And you're rehashing these things or you're just ruminating on it. Okay, that's not helpful. I'm going to worry about that later. And you just remind yourself of that. And then when your worrying time comes around, you might just sit at the table and be like, okay, what are all the things I have to worry about today? And because I guarantee that most of the things you worry about all day long are exactly the same thing. So somebody might worry about a family member or somebody else's behavior, or it might be about work stuff. Um, and maybe you are somebody that worries about a lot of like the what ifs. What if it rains on Sunday? What if it's, um, I don't have enough money to pay the bills next week. But just really realizing like, well, what are the stuff I worry about? Sometimes we'll have people write it down for a week just to kind of keep a log so that they can become more aware of, okay, I worry about, say, my car payment, but I worry about that seven days a week and I'm only going to pay the bill once a month. Like, why am I worrying about it so much? Or I'm worrying about what other people think of me all day long. So I'm not concentrating and people recognize some patterns in there and then, and then be able to say, okay, so during that 20 minutes, you still have time to worry because people find like that worrying somehow helps. Like people will, if they think you're going to take that away from them, they're like, I can't like, what if, you know, worrying is actually helpful. So you want people to know, no, I'm giving you permission to worry, but I just want you to put it on the calendar so we can condense it all. Worry as much as you can. And sometimes people for the first week, they'll be like, Amy, this does not work. I just can't s shut my mind off during the day or I can't stop thinking about stuff, but I'll convince them, stick with it. Just remind yourself, no, I'll worry about that later. And by about the third week of practice, if people really stick to it, like they will come in my office and they physically look different sometimes. Like the weight of the world has actually been literally lifted off their shoulders where they were like, is amazing. Like I can actually like concentrate now. I feel so much lighter, I feel more productive because I'm able to focus. And I realized that, yeah, if I were worrying about my, my sibling or I were worrying about this financial situation, like didn't do me any good. It just kept me stuck in a, in a vicious cycle of rumination that wasn't helpful to me. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And really what's coming up for me is it's also an exercise to bring in more awareness to your thought patterns. Uh, I'm huge fan fan of parts work, internal family systems. And that's been something that really helped me to understand how I'm feeling moment to moment. And I tell people, don't think I'm crazy. I'm just constantly having uh, conversations in my head with all these voices. I mean, really just through the practice of it, it really does have the voices soften and it does give me more mental clarity. So this exercise of three weeks, you know, staying dedicated for once a day, right? Doing the 20 yeah. minutes of worry. Yeah, I could see how that would bring more awareness in. And I would imagine awareness would be the path to breaking loops. I mean, I have not been 
thankfully and caught in a negative or like a perpetuating negative feedback loop and since my last numbing depression like major numbing depression and four years ago i'm sure there's been times in the past few years for sure but i mean i remember for a month straight just <laughs> just caught in the loop like if you are some if someone listening is currently experiencing that now or they know someone quote unquote going through it in these negative feedback loops and they can't seem to break it what's your recommendation on breaking these loops yeah so uh, sometimes it's about you got to change your behavior first so for somebody who sits on the couch and worries and worries and worries and they think i don't know what to do about it sometimes you just got to get up and go do something and again it might just be i'm going to go for a walk i'm going to um figure out something else to do. And again, writing things down to recognize the loops that we get stuck in. So uh, if you are somebody who worries a lot, maybe you manage your worrying by researching something incessantly. So you have an ache in your kneecap and you spend the next 12 hours researching on WebMD to figure out what your problem is, if it's cancer or you're about to die. And then um, you feel like, that. okay, I'm taking action. So therefore I feel better. You're waiting to get into the doctor for a week, but you can't um, function. So you just keep researching, finding a million and one things, yet you're not actually taking any helpful action because you're not moving forward. So when people can write down, what do I do? How do like, what does my loop look like? How does it keep me stuck? And then experimenting like, all right, what can I try to do? So instead of maybe researching, maybe I call a friend and maybe I say, hey, I have this issue. What do you think it is? And hearing it from somebody else helps. But maybe I call them and I also just talk about something else to get my mind off of it. So always encourage people, experiment if you can by changing your behavior and just pretend you're a scientist who's studying. Does this make it better or worse? And obviously feedback from other people sometimes is, is really helpful because we don't recognize that we're doing it and it's hard to see what we're doing and how we're keeping ourselves stuck because we're getting something out of it. Otherwise, we wouldn't stay in that cycle. So if we went back to my example of doing all this research, you think, oh, I'm, I'm gaining all this knowledge and it's somehow going to be helpful to me. But um but it can also just keep you stuck in that cycle. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. And I'm thinking about people going through spiritual awakening experiences and what I call being activated. And, you know, I've been that, that student of the universe going down every single rabbit hole and yeah, it absolutely can just make things more confusing, more overwhelming and keep you more stuck versus grounding into the physical form, kind of slowing down. Um, that's something that comes up for me, but, this brings me to how I even got connected with you. I forget exactly what I was researching for, but it was an article or a podcast you did about chasing discomfort and leaning into mm -hmm. uncomfortable moments. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, our, you know, obviously we want to run from discomfort. And people will say that in my therapy office too, like, Amy, why would I want to do anything to make myself uncomfortable? I'm uncomfortable. Why would I want to go thir three minutes in a 30 degree ice bath? That sounds terrible, right? Right, yeah. right. But uh, it's really our ability to figure out sometimes like our brain will say, hey, you can't stand this. And you can usually stand it a lot longer than your brain tells you. Your brain wants you to stay comfortable. And so sometimes I encourage people to do something a little bit longer than they think they can just to challenge their brain. And when you do that, your brain starts to see you as more capable, more competent than you gave yourself credit for, because your brain usually will underestimate you. And it's often, you know, this ironic thing is that our attempts to avoid misery are usually what's making us miserable. So somebody who says, I have so much anxiety, I can't even face this stack of bills on my table. Well, then they don't face their budget. And then the more they put it off, the more, you know, the bills stack up and the worse they feel over the long term. But so often we want to exchange that feeling good in the short term. And then there's the long term consequence. But we don't often make that connection. So we want to do what feels good right now. That's what our brain is really tempting us to do. So we look for those opportunities and shortcuts every chance we get. So sometimes it's about training your brain to say, all right, if this is uncomfortable. It's kind of scary. I'm going to push myself to do it anyway. And we don't have to take a giant leap. For somebody who's scared of public speaking, you probably don't want your first experience to be on a stage in front of 10,000 people. It might be too overwhelming, but you start small with a small step of, okay, how do I face this fear a little bit at a time? Or how do I do this thing that I really don't want to do? And when you do it one step at a time, you get a lot more comfortable with it and it gets easier. 
Yeah, agreed. And I brought up the ice bath example. I mean, I'm not someone who practices ice baths um, on a regular basis. And the few times I have done it, like any, even thinking about it, I'm like, no, no, no. But then once I do it, you it, like, it's an amazing exercise of surrender. Like it's, and you right. feel so much better afterwards. And it's funny you mention uh, going on stage and public speaking. Are you familiar with uh, Sterling Hawkins? No. Uh -uh. He's a keynote speaker and he recently uh, published a book called Hunting Discomfort. And he tells a story of what his ultimate fear, his number one fear was public speaking. And he talks about how he basically had like a nervous breakdown. He was on my podcast and told the story uh, sometime last year. And now like that's what he does for a living. He's speak speaking maybe 60, 70 times a year. You know, he built his business off of it. And his book is literally called Hunting Discomfort, you know, and it was that that had that transformation for him. And you're right. Most people were not going to go straight to the deep end and something like that, you know, but I think there is a certain level of risk reward with these type of things as well. There definitely are. And to figure that out, like I we all don't also have to conquer all of our fears. Like mm -hmm. for a long time, I was a therapist in rural Maine and I had a woman who was terrified to drive on the highway. Well, rural Maine only has one highway. So it really wasn't a big deal for her to say, hey, I'm never going to drive on the highway. But her family really pressured her like, no, you have to conquer this fear. So she came to therapy and she was just so upset. And she said, you know, I, I feel like I have to do this. But, but really, she didn't have to do it. And once I told her, like, oh, actually, if you don't want to drive on the highway, don't drive on the highway. And she gave herself permission to do that. It was like this huge weight was lifted off of her. And so there's that balance to be struck. And I too was always terrified of public speaking, like worst fear in the world. And now I get to do lots of public speaking events. And it's not that scary, but it was one of those things, you know, had I not been put in a situation, it was my, I had to give the eulogy at my husband's funeral, which really shifted my mindset of like, okay, public speaking is not a big deal. I just survived the death of my husband and put things in perspective. But sometimes, you know, just knowing like, OK, your brain again, it's going to under underestimate you and there are going to be lots of challenges in life that it will tell you don't even attempt it. But sometimes it's worth it to say, OK, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to try it and it might not be as big of a deal as you I thought it was going to be. Absolutely. All right, cool. So we'll start to wrap this up and this is a. Uh... We'll start to wind down a little bit, but there's a few more things I want to touch on. And one of them is one of your 13 things that mentally strong people don't do, which is they don't downplay success. I think that is huge. And that's so insightful. Could you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So that's in my women's book about 13 things mentally strong women oh, okay. don't do. Got it. Where uh, we talk about the fact that, and it's obviously not just um, unique to women, but mm -mm. there's that pressure to like, really say, oh, it's not a big deal. Like when you get promoted or when something good happens and we tend to really just want people to know, like, you know, that we're humble. And so to the extent that we won't even acknowledge like the good things that we have in life, or you look at somebody's LinkedIn profile and they're like, you know, I, I don't know, found the cure for some disease, but it's kind of in the fine print. And you're like, wow, you know, you could be shouting from the top of the rooftops, the cool things you've done in life. But uh, it's sort of been ingrained in us. And the other thing is like when you look at our compliment, how we accept compliments, like so often that we're really quick to be like, oh, no, you're amazing because we don't want to just say thank you. Or we are like, oh, no, everybody else helped me. Um, it wasn't really anything at all. We just really downplay it. And so I always encourage people when somebody says a compliment to you, just practice saying thank you. And for a lot of people, that's really uncomfortable because we think it's like almost saying, yeah, I know I'm great. But it's okay to just say thank you and accept a compliment. And it's a great exercise in just practicing tolerating that uncomfortable feeling that might come up for you. Yeah. Receiving is so hard. It's so right? hard. That's, yeah, that's been my journey. And, you know, this, I didn't realize it. I, I looked at one of your websites, links, something. And so I pulled it from one of your four, four or five books. Uh, so my workbook will be number five. Number five. So one of your four books out already that specific one, but don't downplaying success is something that really resonates uh, with me. And I was named to Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 list in 2019 when I was 31 years old. And I mean, I still have trouble. Like I say that because, you know, it's street cred, right? right. So I, I utilize that. But at the same time, it's 
I always get caught. Hey, if Zuckerberg and like all these guys in, in Silicon Valley have never been on that list, then it's a BS list if I'm on it. And they, right, like, right. this is just like a networking list, you know, like it's so easy to get caught up in that. And then the other side too, is there's definitely been times in my life where um, I didn't mean to be braggadocious or anything like that. But for mothers, my my demeanor for some reason seemed like I was bragging. And so now I'm very cognizant of like not being like over the top with that stuff. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. A lot of us have that aversion because we don't want to look like we're bragging. And then sometimes people do the like the humble brag thing where we put something on the internet where we're almost like downplaying our success, but we kind of want to know like, hey, I got nominated for this thing, but it's not a big deal or we make a joke out of it, like, oh, they put me on this list, but they must have forgotten, you know, who I am or something like that, almost because we're like embarrassed to like say, hey, I have this cool thing going on because it takes some vulnerability sometimes to put ourselves out there and and share the good things going on in our lives, which seems really counterintuitive, but that's what reality is for a lot of people. Yeah, sometimes I find in my own stories and thought loops, I get too caught up in like the societal conditioning and programming designed to keep us in a limited state. And I'm at such a better place now than I was a few years ago. But it used to like, you know, a lot of people that have gone through spiritual awakenings, especially with plant medicines and things like that, start to see the agenda, right? And then you become mm -hmm. very passionate about that. That aside, I'm, I'm, that's not the rabbit hole I want to bring up, but it's so easy to go down that path and and be like, okay, well, this is the way because this is what's wrong with the system. And then you get attached to that and you're not actually making progress because you're focusing on something else. Yes, that is an issue, needs to be addressed, but we can't get lost in that, you know? Yeah, that balance of like, what's within mind control, what isn't? And yes, we would all like to change the world and make it a better place, but in the meantime, how do I focus on on myself and and making my my mind a better place? Yeah, yeah. And is quantum physics something that resonates with you? It does not. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, and, uh, you're not interested, or you? Don't, I just I don't know enough about it to to comment on it. Yeah, because it's not anything I'm super well versed in. You know, I, I'm interested in, it and mm -hmm. I think about like you know, how quantum physics teaches us that the outer world we experience with our five senses is a reflection of our inner world. And when we are going through it and we're such as you with your mother, your husband, the foster child and all this, what comes up for me is like when any of us have a situation like that, is it kind of like something that's happening for us to go within and it's uh, orchestrated, you know, like, does that ever cross your mind or is that of interest or not at all? You know, it is. I think all of those, you know, questions, obviously, I'm like in this existential crisis in my 20s of like, you know, what's the uh, what's the hidden meaning here? What's the message or what's going on? And uh, gosh, and I, I gave a TED talk and in it, I explained how uh, like the the similarities between the night before my mom died and the night my husband passed away. And I was at the same auditorium. It was like the only time I'd been in this auditorium. And when you read the comments, people are like, you know, either I'm cursed or the auditorium was cursed. And just interesting to hear people's you know views on all of that and i i had grown up um with a mom who who brought me to church we had a strong faith so then i was like all right is this you know god's um plan to have all of these things happen is it not his plan did i do something wrong like tons of questions about about life and where i fit into that and psychology versus spirituality and how those two things intersect um yeah a lot of soul searching went on for sure yeah, absolutely. Well, without going there, let's uh let's start to finish this up with some uh mental strength exercises. Do you have one or two of your favorite mental strength exercises that you could share with us? A simple one is just naming our emotions. So we talk so much about like emotional intelligence and recognizing how other people feel, but the truth is we're actually kind of bad at recognizing how we feel, but there's Research that will show just naming an emotion takes a lot of the sting out of it. So if you can wake up tomorrow and say, hey, I feel kind of anxious today, you'll probably feel a little bit less anxious because it helps your brain make sense of what's going on in your body. So always encourage people, maybe check in with yourself a couple times a day. Maybe when you're brushing your teeth, you just pause for a second and say, how do I feel right now? See if you can put a name to it. And a lot of people are like, you know, beyond happy, sad and mad, I'm kind of stumped at what even an emotion word is. So sometimes people will print out a, a list and then just kind of say, OK, I'm going to hang this on my bathroom mirror. So while I'm brushing my teeth, 
I feel like I'm expanding my emotional vocabulary a little bit. And the truth is, you probably have a bigger emotional vocabulary. You just don't use it often enough to be able to recall the words. We don't talk about our feelings that much as adults. So that's one thing, just to start naming your emotions. And then another thing to follow up on that is to ask yourself sometimes, is what I'm feeling right now a friend or an enemy? We talk so much about feelings as if they're either positive or negative. Like people will say, you know, excitement's a great emotion. That's a positive one. But anger, that's a negative emotion. But in reality, well, if you're excited about a get rich quick scheme, you might fall prey to it because you don't remember that there's a downside to it. So excitement can be either uh, helpful or not so helpful. Same with anger. Anger can give you courage to stand up to someone if you're in an unhealthy situation, but obviously anger might also make you say things to your loved ones that you don't really mean and you might hurt them. So just asking yourself, okay, how do I feel right now? Is this a helpful or hurtful or a friend or an enemy? Either way you can phrase it. And then figure out, well, how might that affect my behavior today? And we know when it comes to emotions, like if you're sad, don't negotiate. You're a terrible negotiator when you're sad because we don't want to be rejected. So if somebody makes an offer, we'll accept it. We won't even make a counter offer. Or if you're anxious about something, it might be something in your personal life. You're anxious about your uh, grandmother's health right now. You go to work and your boss is all, hey, I have this new project for you. What do you think? You're much likely to be like, no, actually, I don't want that. It's your anxiety from one area of your life spills over. So just becoming more aware of how we feel, how those emotions affect our behavior can help us definitely become mentally stronger. I love that. Yeah. Awareness, uh, all these tactics to just bring in how we feel in the moment. And that's something I talk about all the time. Like, how can I feed my soul? For a lot of us, it's the question once a day, how, what can I do today? I love myself. How can I feel my soul? But like the next evolution of that is being able to check in moment to moment. And I love the brushing the teeth, um, idea of just when you're brushing your teeth, print out list. And that's a really good way to expand to, to your point versus like the basic emotions that most of us are more familiar with. So thank you for sharing those. Absolutely. Yeah, it's awesome. Amy, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Now, this podcast is going live the, the week of the launch of your workbook. Tell us a little bit about your workbook. So my first book was called 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. That was the one that uh, came out um, 2013. And since then, so many people have asked for more exercises. They had more questions. So we decided to create a workbook. So this one is a uh, Based on it, it's called 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do Workbook, filled with actionable exercises, things like scheduling time to worry or identifying your emotions so that people can come up with their own plan for how they're going to become the strongest and best versions of themselves. This is incredible. And your books, you have several different niches. You have one for women you mentioned. You have another one for kids that I can see behind you. What's the, what's the fourth one? Uh, the other one was a parenting one. So after my first book came out, I had a lot of people say, how do we teach this to kids? So I wrote 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Don't Do so that parents could get that in their hands of how do you raise kids to be mentally strong in today's world? Perfect. I'm buying that right now because as I mentioned, I stepped into partnership with uh, Jamie, who's going to be, you're going to be on her podcast and she had a five-year-old. Now she's six and we all live together. So I'm getting the fast pass in parenting. So I could definitely use that. So I'll buy that today. I can't wait to dive into that. I'll get the workbook as well. Guys, check out Amy's work. This is absolutely, absolutely incredible. And Amy, I just want to thank you again. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you so much for having me. 